The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Welcome to An Open Door on the Arts. I'm Barbara Richer and I'll be your host for this series of programs on the arts in the Capital Region. Together we'll be opening the doors to music, theater, dance, visual arts, and many amazing opportunities and entertainment offered here in our area. There'll be an email address at the end of this program and I would love to have you send to me any ideas that you may have on particular arts programs that you have really related to or have given you so much to think about that you'd like to share that with our audience. So get paper and pencil now, watch for the end of the program, write that email address down. Today, however, I don't have any problem with where our focus is. Today, our focus is on the Albany Symphony Orchestra. It was founded 85 years ago by a gentleman named John Carabella. It was originally named the People's Orchestra of Albany. Isn't that wonderful? And it began with 24 brave members and a dream. Today, I believe that the ASO is central to the arts culture in the Capital District. American Record Guide has called them one of the country's greatest orchestras. I'm thrilled today to have David Allen Miller, the maestro of that orchestra, with us. Because over the past 20 years, he, the ASO has won numerous national awards as a result of the vision and dynamic leadership of this multi-talented maestro. We're so excited to have you with us, David. Well, thank you, Barbara. I'm so happy to be with you and uh, so appreciate all you've done for the arts and for the symphony through your involvement with Vanguard. Much appreciated, our volunteer organization. It's very easy to do when there are people like you on the receiving end. I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, um, by learning a little bit about you and how you came to the ASO. Well, I'm a, a native of Los Angeles and uh, born and raised in the San Fernando Valley. And as a child, I studied a little bit of piano, but then I got very interested in trombone playing, of all the things. So that was my Wonderful. main instrument. And then in high school, I began to think that I might want to have a career in music and maybe didn't want to be a full-time trombonist. So I began to look around for various options and announced to my father that I wanted to become a conductor when I was 15 <laughs> years old. So he went all over Los Angeles finding out about conducting teachers, and he found me this fabulous, very elderly uh, German maestro named Fritz Zweig, who was living and teaching in, in Hollywood. And I went out weekly and took a lesson with him and subsequently started taking piano lessons again and viola lessons and composition lessons and keeping up my trombone playing. And then I went to UC Berkeley undergraduate uh, for a degree in music, a bachelor's degree in music. And then I went to the Juilliard School uh, and uh, spent two years there doing a master's. And then I conducted a wonderful orchestra in New York, the, the New York Youth Symphony, which is the mm -hmm. big youth orchestra mm -hmm. in town that plays three concerts every year at Carnegie Hall and spent six years there really building that orchestra. And then I was invited back to Los Angeles by by then music director Andre Previn to be his assistant and then associate conductor with the orchestra. What an exciting position. That was really fun. I spent five years there and then I was um, offered the job in Albany and I came here 23 years ago. So this is my, my 23rd season. And how would you describe your vision for this orchestra from that first day that you came here, that past vision, and now in the present? Well, I must say that, that long before I came to Albany, the orchestra already had a very clear mission thanks largely to that very celebrated uh, longtime board chair, Peter Cromani, who was yes. the board chairman yes. for about 30 or 35 years. And Peter was a really passionate, and is, continues to be a really passionate advocate of living music and of American music. And mm -hmm. so the orchestra already had a really national and dare I say international reputation, although it was a very small budget orchestra at that time, about $750,000 for the entire budget. Um, mm -hmm. It had a great reputation. So that, that's really the reason I came. And my ambition has been really to grow Grow and develop uh, that that profile, that mission, and we really have done that, you know, by championing innumerable numbers of young composers, living American composers, uh, com uh, recording, commissioning, and really integrating living music into what we do in many well, ways. Well, I know as an audience member for many many years now. Um, 
that 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 mission is is absolutely working. Um, I think that it, it uh, modern American music can be quite challenging sometimes, um, but I see the audiences very much more embracing and coming and hearing and celebrating all the uh, the modern American music you've brought to I think us. It, I think it used to be much more challenging I, I, when I was coming up when I was at Juilliard when I was a student. Uh, mo much of the music that was being played was really esoteric and very abstract and really hard to sit through. And, and I found it very frustrating because very often there were pieces that I couldn't understand mm -hmm. at all. And I'm a trained musician and all that. But I must say that there's been this wonderful move in the last 30 or so years uh, of living composers, and particularly in America, to write much more accessible tonal music, music that really connects both to the grand tradition but mm -hmm. also to mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. pop music and pop mm -hmm. culture. So I actually think that part of the reason we're having so much success is because the, the new music we're playing is really exciting and it, it complements really well the great classics that are very much a part of our, of our offerings. Well, I have heard it said, too, that the um, Albany audiences are probably the best educated, most appreciative audiences of modern American music, and in large part, that's due ex exactly to what you've brought to us. Well, like they say, you are what you eat. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I must say, from the moment I got here, this is a very, as you know, being a longtime resident of, of the Capital Region, um, this is a very sophisticated community, a very educated community, a very culturally active and aware community. You know, maybe partly it's the proximity to New York and Boston and Montreal, partly the fact that we're the state capital of the great state of New York, perhaps also because of all the universities and mm -hmm. medical centers and such mm -hmm. around here, but it's a very culturally rich, educated community. So so selling interesting, exciting, unusual art to this public just really isn't as hard as it probably is in certain other places. Well, that's good to know, and I'll take that as a compliment. Now, I know that you recently won a Grammy. Will you tell us a little bit about that amazing piece of music and the woman that shared the stage with you in the remarkable ASO? Sure. Well, I should say that, that one of the, the wonderful things about the, the Albany Symphony that's very different from other orchestras is that we have all along and, and continue to record a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there was a huge crisis in the world of recording, both of classical and pop, every pop kind of recording, because some years ago, as, as digital technology changed and everything went to the internet, and it began to become very apparent that people weren't able to sell uh, CDs or records the right. way they once were. And so the bottom really fell out of the recording market. And most orchestras just stopped recording entirely. But we have this very special niche that you already mentioned that when we record a work, it's invariably a new work. We don't record Beethoven symphonies and Brahms symphonies. Right. There are plenty of recordings and performances on YouTube of, you know, that you can buy, that you can watch on the internet available. There's no reason that we need to uh, add to that giant body of work. So when we record a work, it's invariably a brand new work that simply is not available to anybody to hear or to experience in any other format. Mm -hmm. So we've had a long history, particularly with Albany Records, the record company that Peter Kamani, our longtime board chair, started, but also with uh, other record companies as mm -hmm. well, of, of making recordings virtually every year and sometimes two or three per year um, for the last I don't know, 30 or so years, before my tenure, the orchestra mm -hmm. was already making recordings. And as the orchestra has gotten ever better, the recordings have gotten, I think, more exciting and more successful, and, and uh, we've developed quite a reputation as a recording orchestra. So this was a project that we uh, that I had wanted to do. It was a, a, a relatively new percussion concerto by the great American composer John Corleano, who is not only famous as one of the great uh, concert music composers, but is also very famous as a, a movie composer. He's only written about five or six sound uh, soundtracks to films, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. among them is, are the Red Violin, which won the Academy Award. It's wonderful. Uh, and also Altered States, he wrote the soundtrack for, for that. Mm -hmm. So he has this really major profile in the film world, even though he's only scored a few films. Uh, and, and this was a, a percussion concerto that he wrote, uh, I think about seven or eight years ago, for the great Scottish percussion virtuoso Evelyn Glennie, who's a great friend of mine and a, somebody with whom I've collaborated a great deal. And it was commissioned by a number of different orchestras. I think it was premiered in Pittsburgh and I was invited down to Nashville, to Nashville Symphony, to do the second set of performances right after the, the, the two weeks after the Pittsburgh performances, mm -hmm. and I did those, and I really loved the piece. It was the first time I'd worked closely with John Corleano. He's a beautiful man. It's a fascinating piece where the whole front of the stage is displayed with hundreds of percussion instruments. It and is astonishing. It's a really neat it's thing. It's completely and she, visually astonishing She, she well. is almost like a ballet dancer, the way she moves from instrument to instrument, yes. the way she, yes. she performs the piece visually as well as sonically. 
periodically. Yes. So uh, as soon as I did the piece in Nashville, I said, we have to record this in <laughs> Albany. So I took a few years, but we ended up bringing her and, and we recorded the piece and recorded another beautiful vocal piece of John's called Vocalese. And it was issued by Noxos, um, I guess, just a little more than a year ago, like barely a year, probably not even a year and a half ago. And much to my amazement, uh, it was nominated for a Grammy. And I was, I didn't really realize what that meant because I'd never had a, a CD nominated for a Grammy. And I had a concert the very weekend of the Grammys. Um, but my wife insisted that I fly out. We, we had a beautiful memorial concert for my great colleague, David Janauer, the longtime conductor yes, of the yes. Albany for Musica, who passed away quite suddenly and tragically um, in midlife and mid-career. Yes. Uh, and we had a memorial concert, a beautiful concert Saturday night. And my son, Ari, my youngest child, and I, because he's really into pop music and someday is going to win 25 <laughs> Grammys. Uh, my wife felt it was important that he go see the Grammys. So we drove down to Newark. We slept for about an hour and a half. We jumped on a 7 a.m. Oh my plane. Gosh. My dad met us at the airport in Los Angeles. He gave us a car. We drove across town. We got to the Grammys just as they were starting. And sure enough, um, surreally, oh my gosh. we won. And I must say what I found so striking, I've always been aware of the Grammys, and but I, it's never been major consciousness of me uh, for me. But it was so exciting because you know people who don't know anything about the orchestra, about classical yeah. music, yeah. know about the Grammys. And so it, it was this incredible kind of breakthrough moment for us because when of you win a Grammy, course. all sorts of people who otherwise wouldn't register what you're doing know about what you're doing. Oh, so when I came okay. home, it was really exciting that people in the local village deli in, in Slingerland <laughs> stopped me and, uh, you know, the guys who work there, has the statue come? You know, they're, they're very involved in the process and, and the whole community really embraced it. So it was very exciting for me, for the orchestra, for Evelyn. So do and you think it, we're going to be able to be looking at for you on the red carpet in years to come? Well, it does make one hungry to win more, it's true. And I do feel rather behind, you know, Itzhak Perlman, who I think has 16 and various other artists. Uh, we are continuing to record. We have some very exciting releases coming out this year, a John Harbison disc this fall, uh, Christopher Rouse disc this spring. And we have about almost three years of recordings in the can in various stages of post-production. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will have, my, my hope and my plan is to be able to issue a CD every six months for the next, for the foreseeable future. How remarkable. And my hope is that a couple of them will be worthy of Grammy consideration yeah. and maybe we'll be lucky again. But it's a very uh, secretive and difficult process and, and I'm, I think very often very worthy uh, projects are passed over. Well, they have to be. There's so much talent in the in the world that we were remarkably fortunate to have it's you. A very and lucky, lucky moment. Be out yeah. there for that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. I'm, I know that you have that ASO has a wonderful uh, Christmas program coming up, and we'll be able to air this taping uh, prior to that. And I want to encourage as many people as possible to embrace the season with the Albany Symphony Orchestra. So. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what's planned for that. Sure. This is one of our very favorite uh, um, activities, concerts of, of every season. Um, it's December 7th, Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. at the Palace Theater in Albany. And what we love about it is that we share the stage, the orchestra and I share the stage, with about two or 300 of the most gifted, talented young people from around the community. Right, so Let me just stop you for one second, because I do want to hear about this, and I want our audience to hear about this, too. But I also would like you to tell us about the, the classical music concert at the Troy Music Hall. So I'm going to let you fly ahead with all both of these oh. wonderful <laughs> Christmas <laughs> happenings, and I'll, I'm going to just sit here and listen. No, that's fine. So so, <laughs> so just in, briefly, the, the magic of Christmas, as it's called, the mm -hmm. December 7th Sunday afternoon, is a great family offering, because as I said, it's all these kids on stage with us, and uh, it's the music studio, the fabulous program that Noel Liberty runs, the Capital District Youth Chorale, Diane Warner's incredible 100-plus voice youth chorus, uh, two dance troops, an, an Irish dance gr group, a tap dance group, uh, brass ensemble, all sharing the stage with us. It's like a variety show of all sorts of Christmas and holiday programs, holiday songs and mm -hmm, pieces, mm -hmm. and uh, a sing-along at the end with the whole audience. So really fun. If nobody's seen, if you haven't seen it, come come and, and see it. It's it like a marvelous, marvelous family event. It is something fantastic. to bring kids and of kids all ages to. Kids love it, and too. our hope is that they look at it and then they want to go exactly. join the music studio or join Capital exactly. Youth Chorale so they can be part of the show. I'll come the next. to see the symphony orchestra again. That, that too. And then uh, two weeks after that, uh, the 21st and the 22nd, we have a beautiful program at the Troy Savings Bank Music Hall, one of the legendary halls of the world that we are very fortunate to have right here in our community. Uh, and it's a mainly holiday themed, but a, a serious uh, concert. It has on it the world premiere of a, um, an absolutely gorgeous brand new cello concert.
concerto by Michael Torkey, who's one of my very favorite composers, with a dazzling piano, a dazzling cellist named uh, Julie Albers, who's a, a beautiful young lady and an incredible cellist. Uh, and then also the Corelli Christmas Concerto and a Bach Suite and some Stravinsky. So it's a, a really charming and wonderful uh, celebration just right there at the holiday season. Great thing if family's in town that weekend. Absolutely. It's the 21st, 22nd in Troy. Uh, it's all on our website, albanysymphony.com. And uh, really exciting stuff. And then all through the spring, lots and lots of very diverse and exciting concerts going on all through the year. I want to mention, too, for our, for our uh, watching and listening audience that the Troy Music Hall is astonishingly beautifully decorated for the Christmas holidays. It so is. you're not only having this wonderful um, audio uh, treat that that just embraces you, but the beauty of the of the Troy Music Hall is just something to behold at Christmas time. So it's very a perfect Christmas. Uh, greeting Absolutely. for all of the audience. And I, I, I assume our audience knows that it really is true that the Troy City Night Music Hall is, is one of the most legendary acoustical spaces in the world. I would say it's probably one of five or six of the acoustically most perfect mm -hmm. spaces for hearing music in the country. And I don't know if we always in our community talk about that enough because we're so fortunate to have such a jewel of a, an, an audio uh, space mm -hmm. available to us. That might actually be a wonderful open door um, segment is about to visit the hall, the, is sure. to visit the hall because you're right. We don't all of us appreciate. It is an incredible what place. What a gem! And I always is. feel like you feel. You, it's like you, the the music blows through it your hair. Totally it's, embraces it's so you. It, direct it, and it immediate. Totally embraces it's so you. exciting. It's such a visceral experience. You're absolutely right. Um, I'm not quite sure how much time we have here, but I am going to see if. Um, you can tell us uh, a little bit about next, this month. We have a wonderful concert, the ASO does, but you won't be there. Well, that's and, true. Every um, year I And make... we will miss you. Well, that's but okay. <laughs> maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the woman, and I'm always so excited when a woman takes at the conductor's uh, spot. That's wonderful for us women out there. So can you tell us a little sure, bit about this her is a, how that came to be? a fabulous uh, Chinese-American conductor named Mayan Chen. Uh, every year I like to have at least one guest conductor, not only so that the audience can see somebody different, but frankly so that our wonderful musicians can get different approaches and attitudes. You know, they see me a lot. They don't see me every week, but they certainly mm -hmm. see me every month. And so having other conductors come through who have very different priorities from my own, not necessarily better or worse, but just different approaches and mm -hmm different things that they might stress with the musicians, I find is, is very um, enriching for our musicians. So I, I always think it's very exciting to have a guest conductor. And I'm happy to cede the podium every now and then to somebody else, because mm. uh, I get plenty of, of podium time. So she's a, a lovely, very charismatic, very uh, enthusiastic personality. I just know her a little bit. We've, we've uh, been in a conference together a couple times, and, and I've heard great things about her. She's the conductor in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, in Memphis. and also has an orchestra in Chicago. And uh, guest conducts around a great deal, both nationally and internationally. And so I just invited her this year to be our guest. Now, does she, when we have a, a guest come and take the podium, does she um, choose the program at that point, or is she presented with a program? That's a very a very good question. It's really a, a, a very involved give and take process, because there are all sorts of limitation factors and mm -hmm. considerations. You know, what else is already on the season? You know, you don't want to have Absolutely. too many of one composer or right. um, I, I, orchestra size, scope of it. If we're in the big hall in, at the palace or in the smaller hall in Troy, it happens she very much wanted to do the Beethoven Sixth Symphony. I love the Beethoven Symphonies. I do all mm -hmm. of them. But the Sixth, I have to say, is the one that I feel maybe the least close to for whatever number of reasons. So I was delighted to have her take that one because I know our audience wants to hear the great, it's a great pastoral, pastoral symphony, yes. right? And she's doing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto with a, a charming young violinist, Carolyn Goulding, uh, who, who was her suggestion. I, I don't know Carolyn Goulding. It's somebody who May and Chen has worked with. So it's, it's very much a give and take, but we very much want the guest conductor to bring whatever he or she is best at. Uh, mm -hmm. She's also doing a great new piece by Oswald, Oswald Golijov, who's a fantastic uh, Argentinian composer who lives and teaches at Boston. That's in Boston wonderful. At so the wonderful new music will continue. Some of that as well. But so it's conductor. always great when you have a guest conductor. I know this from when I'm invited to guest conduct. You, you want that person to bring something that he or she feels very passionate about. So we try to give them lots of flexibility. Will you be conducting somewhere that night yourself? Or I will, will you not be, be just enjoying. I will be out of town that day. 
I'll be at the Harvard Yale game actually because we have <laughs> friends who are insisting we go to Boston to see them to see them that weekend, and uh, then I'll be back that night because the next morning I have this wonderful family concert, our That's Sunday right. Symphony, uh, right. on uh, November twenty third. That's right. So I have a big day on the you. Sunday after the concert, but I won't actually be around on well, the twenty second. We keep you very 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 busy. I know that. We've talked so much about the wonderful, primarily adult programs, except for the wonderful Christmas program, which is definitely a big family event. Um, I know, and I don't know that our whole listening audience knows, that you do a great deal with um, younger children. And when I say younger, I mean starting from like preschool children on up. And there's a wonderful series of Cowboy Dave uh, that you do, that you actually become another persona. You I become do. Cowboy Dave. I even have imagine. a mustache. I, I know. know, and a cowboy hat. It's very hard to imagine because uh. you're always so sleek and handsome up there on that stand with your tux and everything. But we have a Cowboy Dave coming up and then a couple more during the course of the year. Can you let our audience know how young we start reaching these children with music and how much it means to us to bring them right on up to the concert series? Absolutely. We're very proud of our, of our education and our outreach programs, of which we have a great many. And uh, in addition to the public programs, which I'll tell you about in a moment, we have an ex a really extensive arts and education program where we, we basically are in every public elementary school in Albany, Troy, and Averill Park eight or nine times a year and bring all the third graders and second graders from those schools down to a concert every year. And so we have a, a really robust uh, education program. But in addition, our, our public offerings for kids and for families start with this fantastic series that you have been very much instrumental in because our, our friends and our volunteer organization, Vanguard, have hosted and sponsored this set of concerts f forever, as far as I can remember. And, and since you were the distinguished president as well as r running this series at, with Vanguard, I know you've been in, uh, very intimately involved with it. Uh, Tiny Tots is a week of concerts we do, usually late April or, or early May. Um, and I hope you'll go on our website and check that out for those of you who have little, little kids. Uh, it's a fabulous week weekday programs, 40 minutes, 35 or 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. This year we're doing Peter and the Wolf, so a great introduction to the orchestra and what an orchestra is for your very little, littlest kids uh, ages, you know, roughly three to six mm -hmm. or seven, I guess, mm -hmm. right? A lot of preschools yes. come, a lot of kindergartens come, uh, a great thing. And then our hope is that children kind of graduate to our Sunday symphonies, which is what you're talking about. These are Sunday afternoon programs. Right. We do three right. a year. The first one, November 23rd, and then we, we have an all Mozart program where I I play Mozart, who's having a dream in which I invent the magic flute, and then we have another one in the, in the spring as well. So very exciting and really fun and funny 50-minute, very theatrical programs that are great for the whole family, especially for kids between maybe five, four or five, and 10 or 12. Yes. Um, yep. And so, so those are our Sunday afternoon concerts, the Sunday symphonies. And then in addition, we repeat one of those during school time on a Monday. That's our Monday music, which is, again, to bring all of our adopted school kids from the schools to those programs. But I pioneered the Cowboy Dave thing just because I, I did an American music program all about Aaron Copeland, and I thought I'd do it in the guise of a cowboy, and uh, it sort of caught on. So uh -huh. I have a number of Cowboy Dave programs, of which this November program is one, but then I have a, a great number of other programs in which I play composers like Mozart. I do a Beethoven Back to the Future show. Uh, I play various characters from uh, the, the world of TV, <laughs> Indiana Jones. I have a Michigan Miller character, and so those are really fun. So for those of you who have kids between the ages of, of those of your, of your viewers who have children between the ages of four or five and 10 or 12, make sure to know when those are happening. We're doing this year, interestingly, we're doing the first one and the last one, I believe, we're doing at the Palace. The middle one we're doing up in Saratoga because there's so many young families in the Saratoga area. That's a uh, great up addition. Up in Zankel, yeah, yeah, so we're very that's excited a grand about addition. that. Well, the Tiny Tots has been up in Saratoga for a few years, and that program has just grown by leaps and bounds, so it's just very wise to, to do another program and up we in love, that area. We love to do Tiny Tots, and we love to do it up there as well. Well, if, if any of our viewing audience hasn't already had their children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or nieces and nephews right. or next-door neighbors to any of these programs, they really, really want to try and get out to them. It's beyond just seeing you assume a whole other persona, which is, which is wonderful in and of itself. Watching the children become involved and watching them understand it and buy into it and want to be part of it and cheer it on is is 
completely amazing and so um, it's so incredible to introduce the arts at that age and then as you've done plan things um, periodically that bring in other ages so that the kids could come right on up to adulthood right. and, um, and, it's, as, and, and, it's, and be appreciative of music and as it's, you know it's so it's so critical that we introduce our children to to the arts early because all the studies have shown that young people who are in, who are introduced to the arts whether it be theater or dance or music or anything uh, that that those are the ones who will develop a lifelong passion and interest for those fields. Absolutely. So, and we have a great time. It's always very audience interactive and funny, and uh, so I hope that all your viewers who have kids or grandkids will, will come on down to those concerts. I do too, especially also with the cuts in so many school music programs that it's so hard for for all of us who are who are champions of the art to watch that happen. Um, it's wonderful to know that if something's happening at a school and a, a child is is no longer involved in a, a music program that they can come to they the Albany come, Symphony. Right. And, but I must um, say, I've always been so impressed by our region that we do still have so much music in the schools. I was talking to a friend who's working with an orchestra in Alabama, and she mentioned that there are no kids playing string instruments because the schools cut string programs 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. We fortunately still have lots of robust music programs, so we have lots of kids who are interested in music, who are involved in music, and this is just a great piece of that that we want to keep Yeah, We keep are going. fortunate in many, many ways here in the Capital District. I want to let the audience know, because I think we could go on and on forever. I know I could talk to you for forever, and I know you're so knowledgeable, and you've you know, already brought so much of us uh, to us today. But I have asked you, and you have agreed, that in the spring we will be doing a three-part interview series um, on the Albany Symphony Orchestra, and I'm looking forward to covering in even more detail uh, some of the music things that are happening from the youngsters all the way up, uh, a little bit more about uh, the modern American music, and um, just really really ha reaching a wider audience uh, so that they can appreciate the true jewel that has been 85 years in the making and continues under your amazing baton at this time. Well, so, that will be great. I, I, I look forward to that. I, I look forward to it, too. Yeah. Um, thank you all for watching. Thank you all for who made this show possible and all of you out there watching and spreading the word that the arts are, are alive and well in the capital region. I look forward to your input as we move along and any ideas that you may have on which doors we can open on the arts next. Watch for our schedule and all the information on how to attend, support, and learn more about the many activities of the Albany Symphony Orchestra at the end of our program. I look forward to seeing you in a month or two. Take care.